Hello, my name is Rob Innes, and I will be reading pages 116 to 122. The section of the the title of the section I'm reading is Resistance, quote, I am the father of this child, end quote. Parents and children developed a variety of strategies to resist residential schooling. The parents might refuse to enroll students, refuse to return runaways, or they might refuse to return students to school at the end of the summer holidays. They also called on the government to increase school funding, to establish day schools in their home communities, and to improve the quality of education, food, and clothing. In taking such measures, they often put themselves at risk of legal reprisals. Almost invariably, the system declined to accept the validity of parental and student criticisms. Parental influences were judged by school and government officials to be negative and backwards. The schools often suspected parents of encouraging their children in acts of disobedience. Once parents came to be viewed as the enemy, their criticisms, no matter how valid, could be discounted. Prior to 1920, when the Indian Act was amended to allow Indian Affairs to compel children to attend residential school, the most effective form of resistance that parents could make was simply to refuse to enroll their children. This measure was so effective that it contributed to the closure of a number of residential schools. The Battle for Saskatchewan School, which had a capacity of 150 students, had an enrollment of 35 in 1915. The school was closed two years later. The High River Alberta School could also hold over 100 students, but by 1922, the year it closed, the school had an enrollment of only 40. The Miller Church Manitoba School was not re rebuilt after it burned down in 1906, in large measure because it could not recruit students, enough students. For similar reasons, the St. Boniface Manitoba School closed in 1905, the Calgary Alberta School closed in 1907, the Regina Saskatchewan School closed in 1910, the Elkhorn Manitoba School closed in 1919, and the, the Red Deer Alberta School closed in 1919. By refusing to their children, by refusing to enroll their children in the industrial schools on the prairies, parents not only undermined the government's assimilation policies, but it also deprived the schools of per capita grant revenue and student labor. As a result, the industrial schools ran significant deficits and overworked and underfed the children they did recruit. This led other parents to withdraw their children from the schools. This was never a risk-free choice for, for parents. Often, residential schools were the only available schools. Parents who wished to see their children schooled had few, if any, options. Sometimes, government officials also took reprisals against the parents who kept their children out of school, in some cases denying them food rations and treaty payments. Parents continued to keep their children out of school well into the 20th century. In 1941, only 45 students were enrolled in the Fort Providence School, which had an, uh, an authorized attendance of 100. In at least one instance, parents homeschooled their children. In 1941, Muriel, Doreen, and Kathleen Steinhauer were kept home from the, from the M10 residential school because their parents were not satisfied with the progress they were making at school. Their mother, Isabel, had been a school teacher prior to her marriage and homeschooled her children. Sometimes, parents took their children out of school against the wishes of the principals. In 1904, a husband and wife attempted to remove their daughter from the Copper Island School when Principal G. DeCano informed them that when they signed the admission form, they had given the government the right to determine when their daughter would be discharged. The father said, Quote, I am the father of this child, and I don't care what you and the government have to say about it. End quote. After being told he could be persecuted, the father left with his daughter anyway. In 1913, when a mother removed her daughter from the Fort Resolution School, the Mounties were, Mounties were called in, and the mother surrendered the, da the daughter to the school. In response to the death of a student in 1922, local parents withdrew their children from the Kitimat British Columbia Residential School. 
they, re they agreed to return them only on the condition that the principal, quote, sign her name to paper before us that she would see that the children got all the food they wanted, that they would be well cared for, and be supplied with sufficient clothing, end quote. In 1948, the principal of the Roman Catholic school in Carston, Alberta, struck a father who was attempting to take his son out of the school. In discussing the issue with Indian Affairs, ban, a blood, the Blood Indian Council insisted on having the record note that this was, quote, not the first time that Father Sharon had hit an Indian, end quote. It was not uncommon for parents of an entire community or, re or region to refuse to return their children to school. In the fall of 1926, for example, parents from communities in Manitoba's Interlake region announced they were not sending their children back to the Elkhorn school. According to the parents, the children were not well fed, the older boys compelled the younger boys to steal, and all the children were poorly clothed. In October 20, 1927, 75 school-aged children from the Blood Reserve in Alberta either had not returned to school or had not been enrolled in school. It took a letter from the police, plus a follow-up visit from the Indian agent, to fill the Anglican and Catholic schools on the reserve. Two weeks after school started in 1948 school year, 40, 54, school, sorry, 54 students had, had yet to return to the Fraser Lake British Columbia School. The police were called in and by October 2nd, 25 of the students had been returned. This form of parental action was common throughout the 1940s. Parents were eager to have their children properly educated and often proposed realistic and effective solutions. In 1905, parents of children attending the Roman Catholic boarding school in Squamish, British Columbia, petitioned to have the school converted to an industrial school. The request was granted, despite the sorry, the, the request was not granted, despite the fact that Indian Affairs officials recognized that boarding schools, boarding school that the boarding school grant allowed for only, quote, the bare necessities in line of food and clothing, end quote. Some First Nations leaders had originally supported residential schools, later publicly regretted their decision. Chief Nipekaset of the Pine Creek Band in Manitoba said in 1917 that he was sorry he had ever supported the construction of Pine Creek School. According to the local Indian agent, the chief felt, quote, the children know less when they come out of there than they did when they went in, end quote. What was needed, the chief said, was a day school. Calls for day schools were, in fact, a common parental request. In 1949, a call from parents for a day school at the Calisos Reserve eventually proved to be successful. Parents might also demand the dismissal of a principal. In 1917, to back up their call for the resignation of the Shoal Lake principal, parents refused to return their children to the school. In this case, the principal did resign. The parents of the Kakwishtahel Kaku uh, of the Kakwishtahel Band unsuccessfully petitioned the federal government to remove a teacher from the Round Lake Saskatchewan School in 1949. They said that, quote, the children's report cards are very unsatisfactory, worth ever received, and she abuses the children too much, end quote. Parents also complained that their children were not learning the skills they needed to survive. Chief, Ke Chief Kijik of the Shoal Lake Band told Indian Affairs officials in 1928 that the students from his reserve, quote, did not know how to make a living when they left school and would like trades taught in school. Eight years later, Chief Shingus of Weiwei Sakapo band sought to have his 15-year-old son discharged from the Bertel School so he could teach him to, quote, work, trap, etc., end quote. Parents also hired lawyers to press their cases for investigations into the death of children who had run away, to complain about the harshness of discipline, to advocate on behalf of children who had been injured working at the school and to attempt to have the children discharged from the school. One of the more unusual protests was mounted by First Nations people, Dene, in the Northwest Territories who, in 1937, 
refused to accept their treaty payments in protest of the conditions at the Fort Resolution School. Their children, they said, were, quote, living in hell, end quote. The residential schools also came under criticism from early First Nations organizations. At, the meeting, at its meeting in Saddle Lake, Alberta in 1931, the League of Indians of Canada called for the construction of more day schools to augment residential schools. The following year, the League, by then known as the League of Indians of Western Canada, called for the closures of boarding schools. The League also rec recommended that only qualified teachers be hired to work at residential schools, that medical examinations be given to students before they went to school, and that half-day system be changed to allow for greater class time. In an effort to bring their own residential schooling to an end, some students attempted to burn down their schools. There were at least 37 such uh, attempts, two of which ended in student and staff deaths. For students, at the most effect, for, for students, the most effective form of resistance was to run away. The principal of the Shinguak home in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario School in 1870s, E. F. Wilson, devoted a chapter of his memoir his memoirs to the topic of running away boys. It included the story of three boys who tried to make their way home by boat. They were found alive more than 10 days later, stranded on an island in the North Channel on Lake Huron. After 1894, children enrolled in a residential school or who had been placed there by the government, by government order because it was felt they were not being properly cared for by their parents but who were refusing to show up at school were considered to be truant. Under the Indian Act and its regulations, they could be returned to school against their will. Children who ran away from residential school were also considered to be truants. Parents who supported their children in their truancy were often threatened with persecution. Most runaway students headed for their home communities. Students knew they might be caught, returned, and punished. Still, they believed that the effort to make it home and have a measure of freedom was worth it. So in some cases, in fact, the schools failed to force runaways to return. Some students eluded capture. Instead of heading home, some went to work for local farmers and as a result were able to avoid the pursuers for a period, a considerable amount of time. Running away could be risky. At least 33 students died, usually due to exposure after running away from the school. In a significant number of cases, parents and Indian Affairs officials concluded that deaths could have been prevented if school officials had mounted earlier and more effective searches and notified police officials and family members. In the case of Charles and Tom Ombas, two brothers who ran away from the Sioux Lookout School on October 5, 1956, school officials waited until November before they informed police or Indian Affairs. The boys were never found. Community members continued to search for the remains decades after their disappearance. These deaths date back to the beginning of the 20th century. However, the first system-wide policy outlining procedures to be taken when a child ran away from school that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada has located in the documents it has reviewed dates from 1953. This was 75 years after the government began its residential school system. That policy simply stated, quote, The principal shall take prompt action to effect the return to school of any true principal and shall report promptly to the superintendent Indian agency every case of truancy, end quote. The nature of, prompt, of the prompt action was not was undefined. In particular, there was no requirement to contact either the child's parents or the police. It was not until 1971 that a more encompassing nationwide policy was announced. In pursuing children to their parents' homes, the action of, of school employees could be both invasive and disrespectful. In the town of Lebrecht, Saskatchewan, quote, all the homes were checked, end quote, by the police as part of a search for two runaways from the File Hills School in 1935. 
Running, running away was not in itself a crime. However, students were wearing school-issued clothing when they ran away. And in some cases, principals tried and even succeeded in having them persecuted for stealing the clothing they were wearing. Students who ran away numerous times also could be charged under the Juvenile Delinquents Act. In such cases, they could be sentenced to a reformatory until they were... Oh! <laughs> Sorry. I'll start that one again. Um, in such cases, they could be sentenced to a reformatory until they turn 21. The 1894 Indian Act amendments made parents who did not return truants to school subject to persecution. The Mountain Police were often called in to force parents to send their children to school. The Blue Hills Alberta, I mean, sorry, the Blue Quills Alberta School Journal entry for May 1st, 1932 reads, quote, The savages, having received the orders to bring their children to school unless they want the police to get involved, some parents did obey the order today, but there, were, there are still those who turn a deaf ear, end quote. In 1937, a father who refused to return his son to the Sandy Bay School was sentenced to 10 days in jail. To prevent him from running away again, the boy was sent to a school in Saskatchewan. Parents often outraged at having to return runaways. Wallace Hawawahi's father was reported as being very indignant at the prospect of sending his son back to the school, to the Brandon School in 1936. The boy was over 16 and needed to help out at the home. In this case, the father's argument prevailed and the boy was dis discharged. Another runaway from the same school, Kenneth Thomas Thompson, told the police, quote, I am a treaty Indian of the Assiniboine Indian Reserve. I am 17 years of age. I wish to state the reason I am ran away from the school was because I have to work too hard. In fact, I do not study at all. I am working around the school all the time. I consider, I consider if I have to work, I may as well work at home for my father, end quote. Despite his argument, he was returned to the school. Indian agents often refer to ongoing truancy issues at, at specific schools as epidemics. The, Indian, the, the agents viewed such epidemics as a sign of underlying problems at the school. In 1928, Indian agent Jay Wadi wrote that at the Anglican school in La Paz, quote, hardly a day goes by that one or more do not take leave on their own account, end quote. In 1935, 10 pupils ran away from the Bertel Manitoba School. In the closing years of 1930s, the Subernaki School in Nova Scotia experienced continual truancy problems. It was not uncommon for some students to make numerous attempts to leave the school. On the morning of July 7th, 1937, Andrew Julian decided not to join the other boys assigned to milk the school's dairy herd. Instead, he headed for Thoreau, where he was reported as being sighted in the rail yard. He was not located until the end of the month. By then, he had made it to Nanza in Cape Britain, a distance of 260 miles or 418 port. Point four kilometers from the school. The following year, Stephen Labo 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 Labobi managed to make it back to his home school on Prince his home on Prince Edward Island. The principal decided not to demand the boy's return. Other boys were not so lucky. One boy <clears throat> who ran away five times was eventually placed in a private uh, reformatory. Many students said they ran away to escape the discipline of the school. Ken Laquette attended residential school in Brandon and Portia Prairie, Manitoba. Quote, they used to give us the strap all the time with our pants down. They give us straps right in public. Then this started happening. After a while, when I was getting old enough, I started taking off from there, running away. End quote. Others were seeking to escape something far more sinister than corporal punishment. 
After being subjected to ongoing sexual abuse, Anthony Wilson ran away from the Alberta school. In, 19, in the 1940s, Arthur McKay regularly ran away from the Sandy, Bo Bay, Sandy Bay School. Quote, I didn't even know where my home was at the first time I ran away, right? Uh, but these guys are the ones. My friends were living nearby, what they call ebb and flow. That's where they were going. So I followed, end quote. Ivan George and a group of his friends ran away from the Mission British Columbia School when he, when he was 11. They were strapped on the return. Despite this, he ran away two more times from that school. Muriel Morso ran away from the Fort Alexander School almost every year she, she was at the school. The experience was often frightening. Quote, I ran away. I, I remember running away again, trying to cross the river. It was starting to freeze up. We all got scared. We had to come back again with our tails under our legs. End quote. Isaac Daniels ran away from the Prince Albert Saskatchewan School with two older boys. They, their escape route involved crossing a railway bridge. Partway across, Daniel became, Daniels became too frightened to continue and turn back. Nora Nikan ran away from the Fort Francis School with a friend. They made it to the United States and stayed there for three days before returning to the schools. Nellie Cornwallier was sheltered by Aboriginal families along her route when she ran away from, the Ang from an Ankin hostel in the Northwest Territories after a confrontation with a teacher. Lawrence Waquan ran away from the Fort Chippewan School in 1965. There were no roads and there were no one along the way to support him. Quote, I walked from Fort Chippewan in northern Alberta to Fort Smith 130 miles. It took me five days. I was only about 16. I just ate berries and drank water to survive. End quote. When Beverly Ann Matchell and her friends ran away from ran away from the Linton British Columbia School, they had to contend with the school's isolated and mountainous location. Quote, it was halfway down this big hill and then from there you could see the town and we got halfway down there and we were all feeling like woohoo, you know, like we got out of there and and we're going to go do something fun and and then we got halfway down and then we realized well we have no money and we have no place to go there's no place to go there's no safe place to go end quote the girls at the Sioux Lookout School rebelled in 1955 when they were all sent to bed early after a number of girls had been caught stealing they barricaded themselves in their dormitory and refused to allow any staff to enter. There was a similar revolt in Edmonton in the 1960s when students blocked en staff entry to the dormitory at night to protest the abuse of children. Collectively and individually, parents and students did resist the residential school's attack on Aboriginal families and communities. On occasion, they won some small victories. A child might be discharged a day school, school might be built. However, as long as Aboriginal people were excluded from positions of control over their children's education, the root causes of the conflict remained. That's the end of my section, and thank you.